Earth, the only known planets with life. But you probably knew that, so here are 10 facts you probably didn't know about our home planet. And I'll be running another contest to give away a $20 gift card, so make sure to stick around to the end of the video to see how you could win. Welcome to On the Shoulders of Science. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about some awesome scientific facts and concepts in a fun, easy to understand way, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Earth, the planet all known life calls home. It's the only planet not named after a mythological being, instead coming from Germanic and Old English origins to mean land or the ground. But let's get right to it with fact number one. Earth's mantle is actually solid. If you're like me, you grew up thinking of the mantle, Earth's innards, as a hot and violent swirl of liquid magma that would occasionally belch out a fiery eruption from a volcano. Or you thought of the tectonic plates floating on top of the mantle like a ship at sea, slowly slipping and sliding as the continents were torn apart and merged together. And this is how a lot of us were taught. If you remember middle school earth science class, this is probably how you remember it too. But you have been lied to. This isn't accurate at all. The mantle isn't liquid, it's not even made of magma. Tectonic plates don't float, and they aren't composed of just the crust either. So what's the truth? Well, the truth is that the mantle is more complicated than what middle school textbooks expect teachers to teach their students. The crust, or thin layer of rock on the surface, is made of light materials and would be about the thickness of an apple's skin if Earth were an apple. But the crust is part of something called the lithosphere. The lithosphere also includes the upper layer of the mantle, which is completely solid and marked by the Mohorovicic discontinuity. Here, there is a sudden increase in the rock density, and therefore an increase in seismic wave velocity. And the layer below that, the asthenosphere, is not liquid either. It's said to be in a plastic state. It's a solid, but can kinda behave like a liquid. The solid atomic structure of the silicate rock isn't perfect and has some holes in it. And neighboring atoms can jump to fill the hole but leaving a hole where they came from. So very slowly, you can get a shift of solid material. But over long geological periods of time, it kind of behaves like a liquid. Below that is the mantle mesosphere. It's similar to the asthenosphere. Material still flows, but at a much slower rate. The plate tectonics are actually pieces of the lithosphere, the crust and upper mantle, being pushed around by mantle convection, the solid mantle behaving like a liquid, mostly occurring in the asthenosphere. So what you were taught in school gives you the right idea, but it's not 100% accurate. Fact number two, Earth is the densest planet in the solar system. That's right, not Jupiter, not Venus, not even the Sun is as dense as Earth. This is because Earth is a rocky or terrestrial planet, so it's composed of heavier rocky material, unlike the Sun and four outer planets. But the other three inner planets are all the same, rocky and dense. So why is Earth the densest? Well, Mars has a low density because it is made of lighter rock that was blasted farther from the Sun during the solar system's formation. Mercury and Venus have densities that are very near that of Earth's, but since Earth is the bigger and more massive terrestrial planet, it has more gravity and is therefore able to squish itself together more tightly than either Venus or Mercury can, making Earth the densest. Fact 3. We have a very large moon, and it's likely partially responsible for complex life. Unless you were rebellious and count Pluto, we have the largest moon to planet size ratio. The moon's diameter is 27% that of Earth's. Neptune's largest moon, for example, has a diameter just 5.5% that of Neptune. So in other words, our moon exerts a proportionally stronger than typical gravitational force on us. And this means that it is very good at stabilizing our axial tilt. The Earth currently has an axial tilt of 23.4 degrees, but Earth's tilt slowly changes between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees over the course of more than 20,000 years. So its axial tilt only changes by a tiny bit even over millennia. And if we didn't have such a large moon, the Earth would not be confined to such a small change in tilt. Other planets or passing asteroids would be able to tug on the Earth with gravity, knocking the Earth out of alignment, changing its tilt to who knows what. So the moon, with its constant and regular gravity, essentially keeps a strong grip on the Earth, making sure its tilt stays very stable. 
But why is this so important? So what if the Earth's tilt changes a bunch? Oh, I'll tell you why this is important. It may not seem that way, but the Earth's tilt is a big deal. Even the tiny periodic shift in tilt we do experience between 22.1 and 24.5 degrees creates big shifts in the Earth's climate throughout millennia. So if the Earth tilted much more than this, the climate could completely change, making it impossible for many species to live. Fact number four. Also responsible for keeping us alive is the magnetic field. The Earth essentially behaves like a giant magnet. While Earth's mantle and inner core may be solid, the outer core is liquid. And this liquid molten iron in combination with Earth's rotation creates a strong magnetic field. And our magnetic field is essential for life. You see, the sun is constantly spitting out slews of what we call solar wind, these extremely fast traveling charged ions that are ejected from the sun. And naturally, Earth is hit by some of them. Or is it? Lucky for us, almost all of this solar wind is deflected by the magnetic field. The only bits of solar wind that do reach us is near the poles and excites the molecules of the atmosphere, creating the aurora lights. So why did I say that we were lucky to have a magnetic field that blocks nearly all of the solar wind? I mean, we could have aurora lights every night. Well, we could, but solar wind doesn't just create pretty lights. These charged ions are actually very damaging. Most importantly, they would slowly blow the atmosphere straight off the planet in a process called atmospheric stripping. This is what happened to Mars, our planetary neighbor who lacks a magnetic field, and as a result, it hardly has an atmosphere at all now. But our magnetic field stops this from happening, leaving our atmosphere intact. And while on the note of the atmosphere, Fact number five, our atmosphere is perfectly suited for life. It's a good thing our atmosphere is protected by the magnetic field because it is incredible. And it's not just because it has oxygen. So yeah, it has oxygen, which is very important for life, but it has just the right amount of oxygen. Enough to supply living organisms with enough energy and the means to metabolize, but not so much that it's toxic. You see, oxygen is a very reactive gas. It will react and oxidize just about anything. Hydrogen becomes water, iron becomes rust, carbon becomes carbon dioxide, copper turns green, and apples turn brown. If there was too much oxygen in the atmosphere, it would slowly start to corrode our lungs and start reacting with our bodies, much like it does nearly everything else given enough time. So our atmosphere has a healthy concentration of 21% oxygen. And oxygen is not only important to help us breathe, oxygen, through reacting with UV rays in the upper atmosphere, creates ozone, which is very good at absorbing more harmful UV rays so that they don't reach the ground and damage living organisms. But the atmosphere is only 21% oxygen. What about the rest? Well, all but 1% of the rest is nitrogen. Nitrogen is a mostly inert gas. It doesn't react nearly as much as oxygen and is a perfect filler gas to let us breathe a lower percentage of oxygen. And nitrogen gas is also part of the nitrogen cycle, a cycle crucial to the survival of complex life. And the rest of that 1% is important too. Most of that 1% is inert argon, but about 0.04% is carbon dioxide. And although that number is currently a bit higher than favorable, CO2 has played a critical role in keeping the Earth warm. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, meaning it traps heat from the sun that would otherwise be reflected into space. And without it, Earth would turn into a frozen wasteland. And too much warms the Earth too much and disturbs the delicate cycles the Earth relies on to support life. But that's not all. Our atmosphere also has hydroxyl radicals, molecules that react with pollutants and other volatiles, decomposing them, essentially making the atmosphere self-cleaning. And the pressure of our atmosphere is just right. If the pressure were too low, liquid water wouldn't be able to exist, such as on Mars. And if the pressure were too high, gases would reach the supercritical phase, which would make it inhospitable, such as in the case of Venus. And our atmosphere helps create weather. Yes, sometimes unpredictable weather that forces you inside for days, but also, for example, predictable wind patterns that carry nutrient-rich dust from the Sahara Desert to the Amazon rainforest, a process essential for a stable global climate. So yeah, the atmosphere is pretty awesome. And another thing that involves the atmosphere, fact six, Earth has a lot of biogeochemical cycles. A biogeochemical cycle is any process that recycles chemical elements or compounds via living organisms, the atmosphere, and or the Earth itself. For example, you might be familiar with the water cycle. 
Water in the oceans, lakes, waterways, and plants evaporates over time. Eventually, this water vapor falls back down to the earth as rain or snow. Snow melts, water flows back into rivers, which is used by plants and animals for agriculture and for human industries. But eventually, most of this water makes it back to the ocean to be evaporated and begin the cycle once again. All the water we have has been naturally recycled millions of times. So yes, some of the water you drink was probably peed out by a dinosaur in the Jurassic period. But the water cycle is not the only biogeochemical cycle. Some of the most important ones are the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and sulfur cycle. Now in total, there are so many of these cycles, each so intricate, and each really deserves their own video to capture their full scope. But these cycles are what makes the world go round. Well, not physically go round, but they're essential for life. Fact number seven, Earth has more trees than there are stars in the galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy has over 100 billion stars. That's a billion with a B. And a lot of people don't understand how big a billion really is. For reference, a million seconds is about 11.5 days. A billion seconds is almost 32 years. So while the galaxy has 100 billion stars, Earth has over 3 trillion trees. 3,000 billion trees. That's about 30 trees for every star in our galaxy, or 380 trees per person. And that is a massive number. But it's not enough. Before human development, it's estimated that Earth had about 6 trillion trees. But logging and deforestation has led to the loss of so many trees that are vital to a healthy ecosystem. An ecosystem that can even help naturally curb the effects of other harm we do, such as through carbon emissions. So hopefully one day we can get back to the six trillion trees we once had. Fact eight, the Earth is very round. It does have a bulge at the equator because the Earth is spinning and the sides are flung outward, creating a bulge in the plane around which it spins. But aside from that, the Earth is very smooth. The deepest point in the world, the Mariana Trench, and highest point, Mount Everest, are less than 20 kilometers apart. Compare that to Earth's diameter of 12,742 kilometers. If you've ever rubbed your finger over the mountains on a topographical globe, you might think that this is what the Earth would feel like if it were scaled down. But this is a wild exaggeration of Earth's true bumpiness. If Earth really were shrunken down to the size of a classroom globe, the Himalayas would only protrude out of the Earth by 0.2 millimeters. You wouldn't even feel it. Fact number nine. Earth's rotation is slowing down, but it's for a really weird reason, because at the same time, the moon is getting farther away, and they're both related. Now, to understand why, we have to talk about the tides. Now, because we have a pretty large moon, it creates pretty strong tidal forces. A tidal force doesn't just mean that the water gets higher and lower, it also means that the moon pulls much more strongly on the near side of Earth than it does on the far side of Earth. And because Earth's oceans are fluid, it creates what's called a tidal bulge, where water on Earth is pulled towards the moon on the near side. And somewhat counterintuitively, it also stretches out on the other side, but I'm not going to get into why that is here. The important part for the sake of demonstration is the near bulge. Now, this picture isn't exactly accurate. Earth rotates much more quickly than the moon orbits Earth. So as the Earth moves, friction between the Earth and its water carries the water ahead against the pull of the moon's gravity. So Earth's angular momentum and the moon's gravity are in a constant battle, tugging on the tidal bulge. But the tidal bulge has a gravitational force of its own, and it's also pulling on the moon. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And a component of this force is in the direction of its orbit, essentially giving the moon angular momentum. So angular momentum is ultimately transferred from the Earth's rotation to the moon's orbit. So you might think that this extra angular momentum makes the moon orbit faster, but oddly enough, it doesn't. Extra angular momentum actually causes a planet to orbit at a greater distance, and the velocity actually decreases by a tiny bit, just not as much as the distance goes up. So as a result, the Earth's rotation is slowing down, increasing the length of a day by about 1.7 microseconds every year. And the Moon is receding from Earth at around 3.8 centimeters per year. Theoretically, this would continue on until the Moon and Earth were tidally locked, when the Moon's orbital period matches that of the Earth's rotation. 
However, this process of transferring angular momentum takes so incredibly long that scientists estimate that the sun will engulf the Earth and moon in the next several billion years before they have a chance to be tidally locked. Fact 10, Earth is the only known planet with tectonic plates. By the way, tectonic plates are the plates themselves, whereas plate tectonics is the unified theory and study of the plates. But tectonic plates, plate tectonics, you've heard of them. They are the individual pieces of the Earth's crust and upper mantle that move around the planet. They don't exactly float on top of the rest of the mantle. As I discussed earlier, the mantle isn't liquid, but the mantle does slowly move, forcing plates to either converge, diverge, or slide against each other. They are responsible for much of Earth's geography. It's why all the continents used to be one supercontinent called Pangaea, and why South America and Africa fit together like a puzzle piece. But why are they only found on Earth? Well, it's likely due to Earth's size and its oceans. Earth is the largest terrestrial planet, so it's been able to retain much more of its initial internal heat over the last four and a half billion years since its formation. This extra heat is why our outer core is liquid, and it generates convection currents in the solid but not rigid mantle. Smaller planets like Mercury and Mars have cooled down too much by now, and don't have as much internal activity to support plate tectonics. But Venus is similarly sized to Earth, so why doesn't it have plates? Well, no one is exactly sure, but it's possible that the water in the oceans lubricates the boundaries of the plates, making it easier for them to slide past each other. You'll notice that the boundaries of the plates are almost all in the water. Venus, obviously lacking oceans, leaves Earth as the only viable contender in the solar system to have plate tectonics. And that concludes 10 facts about Earth, but if you want to win $20, you should keep watching. Once again, I'll be running a contest on this channel. After the release of this video, you'll have one week to comment on this video any scientific fact about Earth that I personally do not already know. Whichever fact I deem to be the most interesting and that I've never heard of before will be the lucky winner of a $20 gift card to a place or website of your choosing. Read the description for more details. Good luck, and I will see you next time for 10 facts you probably didn't know about Mars. Thanks for watching.